Hello there, calculus students. Welcome back here. Today we're going to do some practice on the test prep, give you some suggestions on how to go through these and solve them. Remember, you've already tried these on your own if you're watching this. Uh, so the first one, we've got a function f that's continuous, but not differentiable. Okay, so continuous, not differentiable. For, for some value of c in this interval, okay, so this is a little bit confusing. So we're just saying at some point on the interval a to b, there's going to be a place where it's not differentiable. Which of the following could it be? All right, so if you're thinking through this, vertical asymptote, if it's a vertical asymptote, that's not continuous. Okay, the limit where the limit is not equal to the value of c, that's like a hole like this, where you then have a filled in dot up there. That's not differentiable. f of c is undefined. That would, again, that would just be something like a or b. So if it's not defined, if, then it can't be dif uh, differentiable. So this C is the answer. You're looking for something like a, some type of sharp corner. Okay, that would be where it's not differentiable. And a cusp is a perfect example of that, where you have some sharp corner. That's why it is C. For number two, this is kind of a mean one to put at this point of the year. But uh, I'm going to show you how you would do this real quick later on. You would, if you're trying to figure out f prime of 1, f prime of 1 is right there at that point, and we want to know what the slope is. So if we didn't have multiple choice answers and we were just trying to figure out how to do this problem, the way you'd set it up is you'd come up with the equation of that circle or that semicircle, which is x squared plus y squared equals the radius squared. Remember that from your conic sections days of pre-calculus or algebra 2? So that's the equation of that. And then from here you would solve it, but you don't have the skills to solve that yet. You haven't learned that. You'll do that later this year. Okay, so that's how you would come up with this if we didn't have multiple choice. Since we have multiple choice, you know enough right now at this point to be able to figure this out because the slope of the line right at that point right there, at x equals 1, the slope has to be negative. If you can see here, you'd have a tangent line that's a negative slope. And so that immediately eliminates c, d, and e. So now we're only down to a and b. If we took the a 45 degree line right here, 45 degree line, the perpendicular to that line is the slope that would be m equals negative 1. Again, that, I'm talking about the perpendicular of that 45 degree line. That's a slope of negative 1. Okay, so that one can't be it because we're not talking about this point, we're talking about that point right there. That's why b is the answer. Number three is quite a bit easier though than number two. So this one is just saying when is f prime equal to zero? So f prime equaling zero means we have this nice smooth curve and we either have a flat point there uh, for a minimum or a flat point there for a maximum. That's what we're working on. And so that only happens right there. It's a flat point for a maximum where the slope is zero. This does not count. That's a corner. This does not count. It's a corner. This does not count as a corner. And by the way, this is f prime equaling 0. This is where f equals 0. And this is where f equals 0. But it's not f prime. This is saying f prime has to equal 0. So that's the only point where it happens, which is an x value of 0. That's why it's just that one. Number 4. So you don't have to draw yourself a, uh, a grid of what this looks like. I'm going to do it just because it might help explain this a little bit better. Uh, you might be able to just visualize this without the need for drawing this out. But I'm going to put down here 0, negative 1. So i got a point there. And then 4, 3 is somewhere around, I'll put it up there. So that point is 4, 3. This point is 0, 1. Now I do not know what the graph's doing. All I know is it goes through these two points. So does the graph go up and down and up and down and then connect back up? It might. We don't know for sure. Or does the graph just connect a straight line from point A to point B? It might as well. We don't know for sure. Okay, so that's one of the things that we have. This thing here says that it must be true. So first one, option number one. There exists some value C in the interval 0 to 4. So in between 0 and 4, the y value must equal 0. Does the y value have to equal 0 if this is continuous? Differentiable also implies continuity. So if it's differentiable, it has to be continuous. Uh, it's nice and smooth uh, all the way through here. So uh, yeah, if it's for going from here to here, it's going to, oh, I should put a little negative 1 right there. 
0, negative 1. If you're going to go from negative 1 up to a y value of 3, at some point it's going to be equal 0. It's going to cross the, y ac the, excuse me, the x axis. Number 2, there exists a point when the derivative must equal 0. So the derivative equaling 0 is where we're going to have a nice smooth maximum or a nice smooth minimum. Okay, one of these two points. It doesn't have to happen because this could be a nice straight line and it might not have any curves in it. Okay, so it's not necessarily true. This one doesn't have to be true. It could be true, but it doesn't have to be true. And then there exists a point where the derivative equals 1. Okay, so does the slope have to equal 1 at some point? This is the mean value theorem. The mean value theorem where you take the slope, the average of the slope, that looks like a semicolon, that was a negative 1, 3 minus a negative 1 over uh, 4 minus 0. So the average slope or the average rate of change is 4 over 4, or in other words, a 1. So if the average slope between a and b, or between 0 and 4, is 1, then the derivative must also equal the number 1 at some point along the way. That is the mean value theorem. That's what this is, and that one works. So number 1 and number 2 work, and that's why we get wherever that answer went. Or not 2, 3, 1 and 3. There we go, 1 and 3. Okay, for number one, this one's uh, one that's pretty confusing to a lot of kids. So let's focus in on this word parallel. Parallel means they have the same slope. Okay, so we want to say that the slope of f of x is going to be equal to the slope, soap, the slope of the line uh, slope of the line 2x, y equals 2x. So we're, that's what we're trying to compare. These two slopes must equal each other. Well, what's the slope of f of x? That is just the derivative. The derivative is the slope of the function at any given point. So that's what we're looking for. And what's the slope of line 2x? That's 2. Okay, so that's what we're really trying to do is discover when does f prime equal 2. So here we have f prime. So what we're going to do is we're going to plug in to one equation in the calculator, you can just say y1 is going to equal the tangent inverse of x cubed minus x. And then in y2, you can plug in a y value of 2. And then you're just going to be able to see where they cross. Wherever they cross, that's where they're equivalent. Okay, but the key to this was understanding when it says parallel, we're talking about the slope of those two things for it to be parallel. Last problem here. This goes back to remembering that sine x over x if the limit of x is approaching 0, what does that equal? That equals the number 1. Okay, so back from unit 1 where we talked about this stuff. So here we have the limit of sine of 3x over x, and we're going to times that by sine of 3x over x, and I'll put parentheses around that, and times it by another sine of 3x over x. Now why is there three of them? Because it says cubed on both of them, so there's three. So what we do then is this whole thing, sine of x over x would equal 1. So there is a way, hopefully you might be seeing the shortcut, that whole thing is just going to equal 3. This is equal to 3 and this is equal to 3. But the mathematical way of proving that is this. You'd have to give it a 3 on bottom so that this matches and multiply it by a 3 on top. You got to do that with all of them. Okay, so again that makes it so that we have sine 3x over 3x, that is the number 1. And so every one of those becomes the number 1, and all you're left with is a 3 times 3 times 3. That's how you get the answer to this one. Okay, that's it. Good luck on that mastery check.